This is CBC Here and Now. This is new territory for everybody. It's weird. I'm not used to it. I don't think I will get used to it. What about those people with no vehicles? What about those people that don't have friends and family that can help them right now? It's an intense stress at an already stressful time. That's a lot of children to be without busing, and I feel like every child should have the right to ride. What we need to do now is support the teachers, support the students, um, support the principals, and we need to just do better. Bus troubles, outdoor classrooms, hand sanitizer, and staggered start times. It's back to school for many students across Newfoundland and Labrador. It's scary. A little nervous, a little intimidated. I'll tell you what level one students think of it all. Going back to school during a pandemic, that's still ahead. One has to be very cautious and circumspect before making a decision like that on a file of this import. The RCMP says a former cabinet minister did share confidential information with police, but no charges are coming. I'll have more coming up on Here and Now. Good evening, I'm Carolyn Stokes, live in the Here and Now studio. And I'm Peter Cowan, live at Gonzaga High School, where it was back to class for so many students across Newfoundland and Labrador today. Yes, at that school and so many others in this province, it was a day of excitement and anxiety as over 60,000 students returned to class for the first time in six months. Peter kicks off our back to school coverage. <music> Well, no question, it was a historic day as people went back to school. All the usual stress and anxiety that comes with the first day of school combined with all the stress and anxiety of a pandemic. Well, how are individual families coping? Here now's Heather Gillis takes a look. Pictures on the front step in a new book bag full of fresh supplies. Even in a pandemic, some things remain the same. Scissors. Though a dollop of hand sanitizer on the way into school, assigned seating on the bus and matching your mask to your new school outfit is a little different. You gotta wear a face. Four and a half year old Hope Quilty is off to kindergarten today. I might have Nixon in my class. Her 10 year old brother Joseph is going to grade five. The Quilty's Paradise neighborhood was buzzing this morning with students and their families. They live close to school and don't qualify for the school bus. Joseph takes a private one to Paradise Elementary, which means he doesn't have to cross this busy street or deal with the school's packed parking lot. His mom had mixed emotions today. You know, you're excited, you're scared. On top of all of this in a pandemic. Do you want to grab your bag, babe? Quilty believes her kids will be safe at school, but from sitting in their desks all day long to changes in gym and music class and packing lunches that can't be refrigerated or microwaved, there are a lot of adjustments. I've seen pictures of their classrooms, you know, and it's nice to know that there are a lot of um, rules put in place so that their safety is a main concern, although it is very stressful and it, it's not how I want to send my last baby to kindergarten. The Roaches in Cowan Heights are excited, nervous, and cautiously optimistic about the year ahead. I think it's 100% the right move. Everybody look! Tracy Roach didn't even mind the strict rule banning kindergarten parents from school on the first day. And though that's been overturned, she is concerned about her five-year-old's asthma. You know, it's been really good here and everybody seems to be sensible following the rules. So I think that if that stays the case, then we should be okay. I think the parents struggle more than what the kids will struggle. They're pretty resilient. Though a new and uncertain year begins, five-year-old Allie seems unfazed. How do you feel? Happy. While her sister Ella just wants to, to go home. <laughs> the first day of what's expected to be a turbulent year is now over as parents, students, and their families turn their attention to whatever the pandemic may bring next. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's.
There's still a lot of uncertainty for families and for students, and a lot of questions that are still left to be answered. Here now is Meg Roberts has been talking to officials today and trying to get answers to some of those questions. Meg, what are they telling you? Well, the government says it understands the anxiety that parents, teachers and students are currently facing, and they're trying to eliminate that as much as possible. Now, in respects to COVID-19, officials say there are there is a plan in place in case it spreads through a school. They'll talk to the people, um, you know, who are considered to be close contacts of that child, and that could be people who are in class with that child or maybe uh, other close contacts that they would have. And then they would determine, um, you know, how uh, just how close the contact is. Is it a higher risk contact uh, or a lower risk contact? The teachers union says a number of issues have been flagged even in the last couple of days leading up to the start of the school year. And while teachers are happy to be back at work, there's an enhanced amount of anxiety. We still have a concern with the degree to which schools and other public uh, venues are different in terms of expectations. We still have a concern about class size issues. We still have a concern about mandatory mask wearing and why there's a differential standard for public venues and our school system. Another concern that has come up in the last few days is busing. Some parents say their children will not be able to get this to school because they are not eligible for a seat and they're looking for solutions. One possible solution, additional bus runs. Education Minister Tom Osborne says government is looking at doing double or triple runs in some schools, but that would cut into class instruction. He said the possibility of arranging rides before the school day and after the school day as to not cut into the class time was not an option. They had discussion with the with the NLTA uh, early on and uh, it's my understanding um, the the length of the work day for teachers uh, that issue was non-negotiable. Government did push back on that a little bit, saying that an average size school, uh, only a handful of teachers would have to work about a half hour more each day until the end of this month in order to accommodate all students. Now, the president of the Teachers Association says in their collective agreement, the workday cannot be increased. Now, that a collective agreement is up, and the NLT says it hasn't heard anything back about renegotiating. Peter. Thank you very much. That is Here Now's Meg Roberts reporting with me here live. So we want to go to the West Coast now where it was a busy day for grade 10 students at Corner Brook High. They were going there for the very first time. And as Here Now's Colleen Connors explains, there was a lot of anxiety, but not necessarily because of COVID. At 8.30 this morning, level one students were huddled outside the front doors. Nervous giggles, awkward elbow hugs. It's scary. Wellen says he and his friends all feel the same, intimidated for their first day at a new school, high school. But when it came to COVID restrictions, like wearing a mask, he's not bothered. Well, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with it. Yeah? I'm used to it, kind of. He's excited for what the day will bring. I don't know about Jim. That's a mystery to me. Normally, these students would have toured the high school before today. But because of COVID-19, it's their first day navigating the new hallways. While health is the main concern for parents and teachers, these students have a different set of worries. Um, not having my friends in classes, basically, yeah. yeah. I don't yeah. even know where my class is, so. These students have to wear a mask in class if they can't keep one meter apart. That means masks in common areas, hallways, and school buses. I don't like it. I don't like it. Wearing a mask? Mm -mm. Why, do you, why don't you like wearing a mask? Because it's like, really hot. Well, it's that time. The bell is soon going to ring, and Level 1 students are going to pile out of the doors of Cornerbrook Regional High School, all with a brand new perspective on what it's like to go to school during a pandemic. Masks aside, these two say day one went okay. It started with assigned seating in a homeroom of 26 other students. We were like paired into like assigned seating, and I was away from everyone. And I talk, so. And were the desks separated? Like no, no. we just had They're a really close. And we just had to wear masks in the class. Yeah. From there, they toured the school with teachers who wore masks and socially distanced. These two say there was no mention of sports, gym class, or extracurricular. No, it's not fun. I'm not used to it. I don't think I will get used to it. 
I just don't like the mask. That's about yeah. it. Plus, like, like seating. Yeah, plus when you're like walking by in the school and you smile at someone, like it's hard to tell. Windsor and Campbell say they're not allowed to hang out in the hallways or by their lockers, and that most students went outside on lunch break. The best part? Being back with their friends. The worst? They can't connect to the school's Wi-Fi to go on Snapchat. Yeah. It's only the Wi-Fi that's bothering me. Oh, is it bad? I can't connect to it. Oh, yeah. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Cornerbrook. Yeah. Well, from high schoolers to the very youngest students going back to school today, it's always a big moment for kindergartners when they go to class for the first time. Here now is Garrett Berry tagged along with one family as they headed to school. Good morning. For young Jackson Drover, the big day is finally here. Guess what today is? Kindergarten. Kindergarten. Eat breakfast, brush your teeth, slip on shoes, and pack your bag. Can I wear sanitizer in the year? Yeah. Only this year, there's a few extra supplies. Oh, I am in. And, and, Captain America. It's a first day of school. What do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know, a Hulk. A Hulk? <laughs> All right, you can be a superhero. Like no other. I'm really nervous. Um, you know, it's. It's been a long time since he's even been in a store, um, probably six months or longer. And so to send him off to school um, without me is, is a little bit nerve wracking, but I'm, I'm trying to be positive. For Jackson, there is a lot to remember. We explain about the sickness. He still don't know a whole lot about it, um, other than, you know, you have to wash your hands, you have to wear a mask. He knows that he's not allowed to share other, other toys and things like that. But there's also that first day magic. Are you excited? <laughs> I'm so excited for kindergarten. <laughs> Trying to just make it as as normal for him um, as I can, and I'm just trying to bring the excitement to him because it's all new for him. Through his eyes, a world of possibility. Bye, Tomorrow, he'll board the bus. He was all excited about the bus right up until now, and now all of a sudden, I think he's having a little bit of anxiety about it. But today, he's got mom to drop him off. Once he gets into the class and once he sees his teacher and his friends and he rides the bus for the first time and he gets the routine of it, I think, you know, he's pretty resilient when it comes to that. First week could be the toughest for him, but after this week, I think he's going to do wonderful. So it's in the car, out of the driveway, and into a brand new world. Garrett Barry, CBC News, Gander. There's lots more to talk about on here now. We're going to show you an outdoor classroom. Plus, I'm going to be speaking live with the principal of this school to find out how things went and to the head of the school board to see if we can get some answers to some of the questions you have. But let's go back to the studio for Carolyn Stokes and the rest of the top stories today. Thanks so much, Peter. We'll check in with you in a bit. Well, another shock wave has hit our province's precarious oil industry. Husky Energy has announced it will carry out a sweeping review of its already stalled West White Rose extension. As Terry Roberts reports, it means hundreds of jobs and billions in much needed revenue are in question. Right now, it's a large chunk of concrete in Argentia. This massive structure is supposed to form the base of the West White Rose project, a $2.2 billion build designed to extend the life of the White Rose oil field. 60% complete, but its fate is now in limbo. What we're announcing today is our reality. We can't proceed without something changing. This is potentially devastating for our industry. Construction was paused in March because of the pandemic and resulting collapse in oil prices. Hundreds of workers in Argentia and Marystown were sent home, delaying the project by at least a year. Husky quietly asked of the federal and provincial governments to buy an equity stake in the project in order to save it. But with no commitments, it's exploring all options, including cancelling the project completely. The, the pandemic has hit Husky uh, hard. Uh, and in order to proceed with what is even an attractive investment opportunity, you have to have the funds. Husky is now reviewing its entire operations in offshore Newfoundland, where it operates one of the four producing oil fields. The fact they've gone public during these negotiations tells you they're setting off the fire alarm. 
Critics once again blasted the federal liberals today for refusing to support an industry that represents nearly one-third of the provincial economy. It's not a subsidy, it's an investment. The federal government will reap the benefits of this as well, as they already have and are still reaping the benefits of their investment in Hibernia. We're asking them to be a partner in this with us to develop our offshore. And other jurisdictions are luring companies their way to do the exact same things. How can we let it go down the drain? We need to step up with the equity investment, as my father, John Crosby, did many years ago for Hibernia. Ottawa stepped in to save Hibernia in the 90s. Without similar help, many fear the industry could founder. The negotiations are failing, and with it goes our offshore, and frankly, our province too. Yes, fair to say that we are very frustrated. How can we not be? Where are our political leaders? Federal Natural Resources Minister Seamus O'Regan was quick to issue a statement this morning, saying all sides are talking about ways to support the industry. While those talks take place, Johnson says jobs continue to disappear. Supply ships, drill rigs, helicopters, they're all leaving to go to places that want them. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the provincial government already has a 5% equity stake in the White Rose project. Our new energy minister, Andrew Parsons, told CBC Today that the province is not in a financial position to increase its investment. Well, in other news, police will not be charging former Cabinet Minister Sherry Gambin-Walsh for breaching Cabinet confidentiality, even though investigators found that she did, in fact, breach that trust and shared private information. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. Cabinet meetings are confidential, and Cabinet members are not allowed to share Cabinet information. But an RCMP investigation determined former Minister Sherry Gambin-Walsh broke that confidentiality. The investigation was able to determine the information related to the RNC commissioned officer appointments, which was subject to cabinet confidence, was leaked through the use of a personal cell phone. Cabinet approves police promotions, and according to investigators, Gambin Walsh texted Royal Newfoundland Constabulary Officer Paul Didham about upcoming senior promotions. Despite that, charges aren't coming. In this case here, the sus, the primary suspect, the cabinet minister, would have been found not to have benefited uh, in any material way from sharing the information. It is almost akin to sharing the information as a gesture of friendship, and that is what our investigation did uncover. Police say there's little hope of conviction if the breach didn't benefit Gambin Walsh. The promotions went ahead as planned, and the RCMP says the information leak didn't cause any harm. To the best of our knowledge right now in terms of harm, no, obviously it causes considerable disruption within the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary, but in terms of harm, I would say not, but that's an opinion on my part. The public learned about the investigation in April when then Premier Dwight Ball ejected Gambin Walsh from Cabinet. He said it was a decision he took after he learned Gambin Walsh was under investigation. Gambin Walsh remains the MHA for Placentia St. Mary's and the RCMP isn't saying what advice it's giving to the government. That will be a confidential matter in my view between uh, myself and the Deputy Minister of Justice at this time. So will Gambin Walsh return to Cabinet? Today the Premier isn't talking but an official in his office says he's being briefed on the report this evening. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. All four provincial political parties will run candidates in the Humber Gross Morn by-election on October 6th. The deputy mayor of Deer Lake, Mike Guzni, is running for the Progressive Conservatives. He ran for the NDP leadership in 2015. The NDP and NL Alliance both opened nominations today. The leader of the NL Alliance, Graydon Pelly, is seeking his party's nomination. And, of course, Premier Andrew Fury is hoping to hang on to that seat for the Liberals and win a spot for himself in the legislature. Returning now to our back to school coverage, some schools are getting creative when it comes to teaching in a time of COVID. That includes reimagining where learning takes place. Outdoor classrooms are becoming part of our new norm, and while they're not mandatory in this province, they are strongly encouraged. Here and now, Cease Hare has more. All summer long, we've wondered what the classrooms would look like when the kids went back to school in this pandemic world. 
Well, here in the woods in Outer Cove, it looks like a scene from Robin Hood or Winnie the Pooh. Volunteers cleared this area at St. Francis of Assisi School so that the elementary students can learn outside. The outdoor classroom is only a few feet from the school. Desks are replaced with tree stumps. The chalkboard and the whiteboards are attached to tall trees using long planks. This setup in the woods outside St. Francis of Assisi's is unusual, but as educators try to figure out how to keep everyone safe and teach, this kind of classroom is becoming the norm, not only across Canada, but around the world. Outdoor classrooms and learning are becoming the new thing. Health experts say the risk of transmission of the virus is lower outdoors. And then there's the added benefit of integrating nature into the lesson plan when the classroom is outside. Here in St. John's, grade three students in the outdoor classroom at St. Bonaventure's College enjoy the sunshine and the fresh air on birch tree stumps. The school says it's been doing outdoor learning in different ways for years. COVID in some ways was a, you know, a push for us, uh, but it wasn't the only reason. But this outdoor classroom is new. The school has also added three seating areas with benches, and there are clusters of tree stumps to accommodate smaller groups. The school's head of teaching and learning says the anticipated outdoor distractions like pigeons or bad weather are actually opportunities for learning. Because students love that. Students love being out, they love when their curiosity is affirmed and recognized by teachers and it actually becomes some of what they're learning about with their peers. So, uh, you know, the, the short and long answer is they love it. It will be different school to school, obviously, but we're possible. We're, we're uh, really uh, pushing the notion of going outside as much as possible. We know that learning can, real authentic learning, Deep learning can occur in the environment, and if it's possible, we encourage, as long as we have beautiful days like this, we should be able to have the children out uh, as much as possible. The pandemic gets credit for pushing more learning outside, and just like plexiglass in stores and extra hand sanitizing, outdoor classrooms might be a COVID change that sticks. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. School is back in session, but it's going to be a year like no other, and that could mean a lot of anxiety for parents and students. We're going to get some tips from some experts. That story coming up tomorrow on Here and Now.
welcome back. Husky is warning it might pull the plug on a $2.2 billion oil project if it doesn't get government help. As Terry Roberts reported earlier, the platform is already 60% built in Argentia. It was put on hold in March because of COVID, but the company insists it now doesn't have the cash to finish it. Jonathan Brown is a vice president with Husky. He spoke with Peter Cowan earlier today. You're talking about reviewing this project. What sort of options are on the table here? Peter, the, the, the options we'll be looking at, uh, I mean, we will review scope, cost and schedule. Um, but we'll be looking at options for alternatives, developments or, 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 or timelines that would allow the project to proceed. So does that include saying, you know what, we're just going to put this on the shelf and may not proceed with it? Uh, well, on the shelf, how long is something going to be on the shelf? Uh, it, it could be. Um, it could also include cancellation of the project in extremis. You already have a lot of money invested. This thing is 60% built. How realistic is it to say we're just going to cancel the thing altogether when you already have so much invested in it? It's, it's completely realistic um, that that is a possibility, Peter. Um, you know, in common with many other companies and industries, uh, the, the pandemic has hit Husky uh, hard. Uh, and in order to proceed with what is even an attractive investment opportunity, you have to have the funds. And the, 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 the company has to make sure it does so in a way which is prudent and protects the balance sheet for the good of the employees and the company as a whole. What specifically are you looking for here from the federal and provincial government? What we've proposed to the government is an investment that looks um, very much like what was done for Hibernia uh, back in the 90s, which has been an enormously successful uh, investment uh, by the government. Um, so it's, a, it's a, 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 an investment to take a share in the project uh, and protect the, uh, the, future, the future royalty revenues and tax revenues from the projects as well as the jobs that go with it. You mentioned that Husky has taken a financial hit from... COVID-19 and low oil prices. The province of Newfoundland and Labrador has also taken a big financial hit. How realistic is it Absolutely. to expect the province to come up with a pile of cash at a time when deficits are near record levels? There's already concerns about the borrowing that this province has to do just to pay the current bills. Yeah, absolutely. And look, we completely recognize there's, uh, there's a, you know, a whole number of competing priorities that both provincial and federal government face. Um, you know, the situation with the province you've outlined is well understood, and that's why we've been talking to both the federal and the provincial governments. Um, and hopefully, you know, what we hear from Seamus O'Regan this morning is the province and the federal governments are working together to figure out, you know, how they can work together to support industry. The federal government, though, has put a big push on green investment. And yep. so how realistic is it to then expect them to buy into an oil project at a time when it's trying to find ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, not another project yeah, that I, would increase them? I realize that that may seem counterintuitive. Um, what people on the East Coast realize, and maybe other parts of the country don't, is that the production from the East Coast uh, and, the, and the province that we have is, um, the, the oil province that we have is, is very uh, efficient by comparison with all of North America. It's 50% uh, lower greenhouse gas emissions. And we've also put forward proposals to the government that could make this, uh, this platform the first uh, um, uh, carbon neutral project uh, in, in Canada. I've already seen some people categorizing this review as a shakedown, that basically your company is saying, give us some money, invest in this project, or all these jobs and all this future royalties at risk. How do you respond to that characterization? Ah, but I mean, obviously, I would say that's that's not accurate. Um, you know, I, what we're what we're saying today, what we're announcing today, is our reality. We can't proceed without something changing. Um, you know, a shakedown would suggest that that wasn't true, but it is. Um, and you know, the uh, the uh, situation that Husky finds itself in, we're a publicly quoted company, so people can look at the financials and understand that directly if they wish. Uh, so it's actually not that. This weather forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. Take the time to explore this fall. Learn more at stayhomeyear.ca.
time now for a look at the weather forecast, starting with today's highs. What a beautiful day in the east today. St. John's got up to 25 degrees. We almost cracked the 2001 record for highest temperature ever. That's 25.5 degrees. We made it to 25.1, so we were this, this close uh, today. Hard to believe it's September 9th. Such a warm day. Uh, Badger saw a high of 26 degrees today. Much cooler in Labrador, 9 degrees in Lab City today as the high. So here are your weather on the way headlines. A cloudy and another warm day in store for much of the island tomorrow. Cooler temperatures in Labrador. And as we head into Thursday night into Friday, we have some heavier rain that will push through for most of the province. So tonight we're looking at showers for western Labrador. That should clear off uh, later on this evening with some cooler temperatures. Could see some patchy frost in the west and uh, lots of cloud cover on the island tonight. Overnight lows 15 degrees in St. John's. Uh, winds from the west 20 to 40 kilometers an hour. Chance of some drizzle for Marystown in the Corner Brook area and Grand Falls Windsor area uh, tonight. For Labrador there's that patchy frost that you can see later on this evening for Lab City and some drizzle as well for uh, Cartwright and the Nain area with an overnight low of 6 in Nain uh, this evening. So tomorrow morning this is around 7.30 as people are starting to head out the door going back to school for St. John's. It should be a mix of sun and cloud first thing tomorrow morning and 16 degrees to start the day. Some heavier cloud cover on the Buren uh, and the south coast. Central Newfoundland as well. Some cloud there. Western Newfoundland could see some drizzle uh, first off in the morning. 12 degrees to start the day and as we head up north things get much cooler in the single digits uh, into western Labrador. Four degrees with some cloud cover first thing tomorrow morning. So as we uh, look into the day tomorrow, some showers pushing through for the west in the afternoon. And you can see a lot of cloud cover over the island and for much of Labrador tomorrow uh, throughout the day. Heavier rain uh, for the northern peninsula as we start to move into the evening hours for Thursday. So temperature wise in St. John's, we're looking at 20 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud. However, as you move inland, things are supposed to warm up. Environment Canada says that it could get up to about 26 degrees inland, uh, very similar to today with a humid X of 29 degrees inland. So if you're along the coast, it should be cooler warming up as you move inland. Clarenville looking at uh, mostly a cloudy day in 18 degrees. Lots of cloud cover you can see for central areas, 18 degrees for Grand Falls. Winds are cooler up in uh, Twilling Gate with 15 degrees as the high. Gross more looking at a few showers in the afternoon, two to four millimeters there. Lots of cloud cover uh, as well for the west coast. Moving up to the northern peninsula, some late afternoon showers expected for the Port Schwa area. Cartwright looking at a cloudy day and 10 degrees as the high. Nain, a mix of sun and cloud and 12 degrees tomorrow with some showers moving in for Lab City and Churchill Falls in the afternoon. So looking ahead now to Thursday evening and into Friday morning, some heavier showers. Some of the heaviest showers will be about about 15 to 25 millimeters coming through Thursday night into Friday morning and things are going to stay pretty wet on Friday as well. You're going to see some of that on the Avalon Peninsula. Most of the island will see a taste of that uh, for Friday as well of Thursday night into Friday. So here we are uh, 11 a.m. on Friday. You can see it's going to be pretty wet uh, in the east there with some showers in Labrador and uh, some heavier rain pushing through Friday evening. So temperature wise in St. John's on Friday looking at 19 degrees as the high so still pretty warm cooler on the west coast 12 degrees in Corner Brook on Friday and in uh, Labrador 17 degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay there and Lab City looking at a high of just 10 degrees as we head into the weekend. So Saturday looking at some showers for parts of Labrador and the west coast the east looking pretty nice though for Saturday right now 14 degrees a little bit on the cool side but a mix of sun and cloud some showers there for Corner Brook, 17 degrees for Labrador. Happy Valley Goose Bay looking at a chance of showers there, 16 as the high in Nain, getting up to 13 degrees as the high. So looking at the long range uh, Sunday, looking pretty nice for uh, the east, 17 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud and some showers moving in on Monday, but temperatures staying pretty good in the high double digits for central Newfoundland. Cloud cover on Sunday and showers moving in as well for Monday. Similar story for the west, 19 degrees on Sunday and some showers 
on Monday. For Labrador in eastern Labrador, some cloud cover on Sunday there, some showers on Monday. Temperatures starting to take a little bit of a dip there as well for western Labrador, 11 degrees on Sunday, and then cooling down heading into Monday with some showers. So let's have a look at our weather photo of the day. This is the northeast coast, Cape Island Beach. Love this picture. Just beautiful, uh, moody, very moody uh, clouds over Cape Island Beach. Thank you so much to Donovan Hen for sending that beautiful photo in. And if you have a photo you'd like to see on the show, just send it to nlphotos at cbc.ca. After all the preparations and the anxiety, how did the first day of school go? Well, we're going to check in here with the principal of Gonzaga High School as well as the head of the English School District. That's coming up on Here and Now.
busy time, even on a regular day, and even more so when you're in the middle of a global pandemic. So, how did the first day of school go? Well, I've got two people who can hopefully answer that question. With me here is Krista Voki, who's the principal here at Gonzaga, and we have the head of the English School District, Tony Tack. Thank you very much, both, for joining me. Thank you. So let's talk about the high school here today. You had mm -hmm. all of the students. How did that go? I was really pleased with it. We had a staggered start, so our grade 10s came in first, and we went through the safety protocols with them, and then they left, and we welcomed our grade 11s back, and then followed by our grade 12s. The students were really interested in following the safety protocols, and they all came in wearing masks and adhered to all of the requests. It was really smooth. Yeah, because often teenagers, this is a time when you want to break the rules, not a time yes. when you want to follow them. Uh, so are you expecting that you're going to have any pushback or any issues with people either not wanting to wear masks or, you know, wanting this to just kind of feel normal again? I think people do want it to feel normal, um, but given the situation that we're in, I think people are willing to take the precautions that are necessary to have their school experience back. Everybody seemed so excited to reconnect with their teachers and their friends today. I don't think it mattered that they were wearing a mask at all. You went around and got to talk to some of the classes mm -hmm. today. How much was the pandemic and the new rules on their minds? It was somewhat, but most of the one-on-one -on -one conversations were focused on the instruction and who they were going to have as a teacher and who was going to be in their class. It was very much the conversation of a normal back-to-school environment. Okay, so let's broaden it out and take a look at the sort of more global picture of all these schools uh, going back today. Overall, how would you, you know, give it a grade for how things went today? It was a grade A, maybe even an A+. Plus. Uh, this we is why we don't let people grade themselves. <laughs> uh, great safe opening. Uh, and all of our leaders, like Krista, stepped up, did their preparations. I know from a school district perspective, we've been anticipating this day for some time and uh, no, we're very pleased. Obviously, there's still some concerns, some things that had to be tweaked. We'll learn as we go, but uh, a great start, a great launch. What about the supplies? Because there's a lot of hand sanitizer. I know you were giving out masks to all the students. Are all those in place in all the schools across the province? We're, uh, we're literally floating in pallets of uh, hand sanitizer. So that's a great thing uh, that we have the, all that backup, and we've got, we can source more. Uh, the masks, we've got masks in place uh, in all of our schools. Most students are arriving with masks of choice because they don't want to wear our, uh, our rather plain blue ones, but we have them and they're very functional. Uh, so that went well. Uh, it's, uh, other than that, uh, everything is in place. We're, we're good to go. Let's talk about busing because that's one of the things we've heard probably more than anything else from parents. And there were some students who couldn't go to the first day of school today because they just had no way to get there. What's your message to families that may be frustrated that they're feeling left out? Today? I certainly understand that frustration and I empathize with, with people in, in difficulty. I've had some conversations, we've corresponded through email with some parents. There's some heart-wrenching stories out there. It's unfortunate. We've done everything we can and we will get there slowly but surely. We will have busing f for all eligible students by the end of September. Big improvement next Monday, we'll drop it by a few more thousand. Uh, in a couple of weeks' time, we'll be down to under 700, maybe even better, and by the end of September, we'll be at zero. Our busing crew can't say enough about our transportation staff. They worked through the entire long weekend to get this right, and we're making incremental improvements as we go. Certainly from the public's point of view, there seems to be a lot of tension between the teachers' union and the school board and the province. You know, the teachers say we need smaller class sizes, they filed a grievance. We heard today the province saying, you know, the reason that we can't do later and uh, earlier start times and later start times is because the teachers won't agree to work a little bit longer. H how's that actually playing out on the individual classroom level? So we've had really good conversations with the Newfoundland Labrador Teachers Association since the very beginning. Great collaboration on the programming, met with all their special interest councils, met with their executive, really informed the consultation. Um, so it's, it's been a very good working relationship. But, you know, like any employer, employee, organization relationship, it's professional. There are going to be areas that we're going to have to work through. And by large, in large measure, we have worked through. Uh, you know, there's no contingencies to be completely flexible around a certain aspects of the collective agreement and the provisions in place. But we've worked through the major issues. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for joining me. And uh, good luck as things get even busier tomorrow here at Gonzaga. Thank you, Peter. For the first time in forever, I'm getting what I'm dreaming of. A chance to change my lonely world. A chance
flight from Calgary to Toronto was cancelled yesterday following a mask dispute with a family on board the plane. WestJet says the family refused to follow the rules, but as Haligoname reports, the family has a very different version of events. Safwan Chowdhury and his family, including his two young daughters, were ready to go home Tuesday morning after spending a week with family in Calgary. Chowdhury says everything was going smoothly until he says WestJet crew members tried to force his 19-month-old daughter to wear a mask. That's despite the fact that children under two are exempt from Transport Canada regulations. It was my 19-month-old who had never worn a mask and uh, certainly found it restrictive for her for an infant's air passage to wear a mask uh, but of course being desperate to get home we despite there not being a such po such a policy opted to comply until she was crying hysterically um, with the crew watching over us and uh, until she threw up and they said well uh, you guys need to all get off the plane Chowdhury says a flight attendant threatened the family with arrest shortly after police showed up and the plane was evacuated. The flight was eventually cancelled. I can't imagine that we would be the only one that would experience something like this where you have poorly trained staff who are unaware of policies, who are unaware of what the guidelines are, and most importantly, treat people less than human. A WestJet spokesperson tells CBC News their staff have a different story, saying their crew members were not requiring the 19-month-old to wear a mask, instead were referring to his three-year-old daughter. But as seen in this video here, Chowdhury says his older daughter did put on a mask and that it was his toddler who was targeted. Chowdhury says his family is still in Calgary and desperate for a way home. Haligo named CBC News, Calgary. Online retail giant Amazon has announced a major hiring binge in Canada. Amazon will hire 2,500 people to process and ship orders at centres in Ajax, east of Toronto, and in Hamilton. Both are slated to open next year. The Hamilton site will employ 1,500 people, while Ajax will have about 1,000 full-time workers. A small number, a, a number rather, of smaller delivery stations are also being opened in the greater Toronto and Hamilton areas. One of the world's biggest drug makers is pausing its trials of a coronavirus vaccine. AstraZeneca made the decision due to an unexplained illness experienced by one of the participants in its study. This has happened before and then the pause has been lifted, um, but it just shows how much of an emphasis we put on the safety of the vaccine, even though, of course, uh, we're all desperate to see it work. The drug company says the pause is voluntary and includes late, late stage trials. An independent committee will review safety data and is working to expedite the review to get the trials back on track with a minimum delay. UK-based AstraZeneca has been working with researchers at Oxford University and has started phase three human trials in the U.S. Well, hydrogen has often been called the fuel of the future, but a renewed focus on alternative energy could soon make it the energy choice for today. And Canada is aiming to be at the forefront of the emerging sector. Kyle Bax has details on the federal plan to power up the industry. Is what you're going to connect to. David Lloyd shows how he fuels up his new Toyota with hydrogen. He bought the car a few weeks ago. For Lloyd, it's quick, quiet and exhaust free. All the reasons why he's enjoying the ride. Mostly I'm surprised that I could get in on this sort of next wave of technology. Powering cars is one thing, but hydrogen's true potential is in decarbonizing some industrial sectors like steel making, heating buildings and fueling trains and heavy haul trucks. The federal government is putting the final touches on a new national hydrogen strategy to kickstart the industry. The focus is on reducing emissions. Things are changing very quickly. This lockdown has been an accelerant on, on trends that we knew were happening. And hydrogen is one of those trends. So we want to get ahead of it. Part of the strategy will be financial incentives to help spur more innovation and try to rev up the sector. Kyle Bax, CBC News, Calgary.
something special tonight. The St. John's Morning Show is making a music video with the singing group The Swinging Bells and local students are the stars. We'll have more for you on that this Friday, but in the meantime, the group revealed their new back to school tune this morning on CBC Radio. We're going to leave you with that tonight. Thanks so much for watching. Begin. Now we're back to school. No more summer blues. Put on your shoes.